Hi folks, how are you? Can everybody hear me? Are there any questions before we start? So, okay. So I hope you have a second packet with you. If not, you can watch the slides on on the screen and download it when you get a chance. Because we're into the second packet finally. So today's session, we're going to move on from intrinsic value to pricing. And then earlier on in the class, we talked about the difference. Towards the end of the last class, we talked about the difference. And let me review what the difference is. When you value a company, you base the value on cash flows, growth, and risk of the company itself. When you price a company, you essentially attach a number to that company or asset based on what other people are paying for similar companies. So if you think about pricing, it's a three-step process. First, you need to tell me what other assets out there are similar to yours. If you have a company, what other companies are similar to your company? And you're going to see very quickly how much of a subjective judgment this is. Second, you're going to realize very quickly that you cannot compare market prices across companies, price per share. And here's why. If I defined an expensive price per share, a high price per share is just a high number, Berkshire Hathaway is the most expensive stock in the world. It trades at what, six digits, $200,000 per share. And a penny stock is cheap because it's cents, which makes no sense because price per share is almost arbitrary. Why? Because if I issue more shares, the price per share will drop. So what do we do in the second step? We standardize the price. Sounds fancy, right? But we divide the price by something. Price by earnings, price by book, EV to EBITDA. Basically, a multiple is just a standardized price. So basically, you find comparables. You standardize the price. You compare across the companies. And if you're careful, in step three, here's what you do. You control for differences across your companies. In, case, in the case of, uh, of equity investments in companies, higher growth companies should trade at higher multiples. Higher risk companies should trade at lower multiples. You try to control for differences in growth and risk in cash flows. So again, reviewing the three steps in pricing, you start with comparable companies, you standardize the price, and then you control for differences. Before we go into the depths of pricing, let me start with a statement that I will back up. Much of what passes for valuation out there, you know what I mean by out there, in investment banking, in m a in appraisal, is really not valuation, it's pricing. Much of what gets done on Wall Street is pricing. Let me back up that statement. About 20 years ago, I collected about 550 equity research. The motor? Yes. What's wrong, Tim? I'm sorry. So, you know, so about 20 years ago, I collected about 550 equity research reports from around the globe. And here's what I did. I didn't read most of them. I just compared them to see how they were attaching numbers to companies. 550 equity research reports, about 45 were intrinsic valuations. They'd done a good DCF and they did the comparison. 45 out of 550. About 450 were pure pricing. Basically, the judgment was based, based on the P ratio for a stock against 15 other companies, pure pricing. You see, what about the other 55? The other 55 were kind of scary. I had no idea what the analysts were doing. It was definitely not valuation or pricing. It was some kind of self-analysis, psychological profiling. I don't know what it was. But among the ones I could classify, 10 to 1, pricing outnumbered valuation. And this was with equity research. So I said, maybe it's different in m and So I was able to get my hands on 100 acquisition valuations done at different investment banks. It's very difficult to actually get your hands on these because banks are very careful about putting them under lock and key so you can never see how unrealistic their forecasts were. So I, got, I have my sources, I tapped them and I got about 100 acquisition valuations. And among those 100 acquisition valuations, were more 50-50. 50% were DCFs, 50% were pricing, at least on the surface. Then I started digging a little deeper at the DCFs. Now, if you think about your DCF, and you think about the DCF you turned in, what was the biggest single cash flow that you discounted? Of all the cash flows you forecast, which was the biggest one? Somebody. Terminal value. Terminal value, right? So in these 50 percent, that fifty that were DCFs, I checked to see how the terminal value was computed, and guess how the terminal value was computed? In about forty-three out of the fifty. It was computed using an EV to EBITDA multiple, a price to book ratio. 
Your biggest number, even in the DCS, was the pricing. Put simply, no matter where you go in finance, when people talk about valuation, don't believe them because most of the time they talk about pricing. And when I did this 20 years ago, I was a little puzzled and here's why. At the end of this class, just as I have for the last 30 years, I'm going to ask you an exit question, which is you, you're going to have, you've done a DCF valuation of your company or you should have already. You're going to be doing a pricing of your company. At the end of the class, I give you a question, right? Where I say, look, you've done a DCF, you've done a pricing. Which one do you trust more? If you had to hang your hat on one, which one would you use more? And to a class, every single class that I've done this exit survey on, the breakdown is about 70, 20, 10. 70% when they leave this class tell me that they believe in discounted cash flow valuation because it makes sense to them. It's, you know, it's much more fundamental. And they like doing it. 20% say they like pricing, and that's pretty honest. After they tried their hand at DCF and pricing, they say, I like pricing. It's much more direct, much quicker, fewer assumptions. And about 10% become believers in efficient markets after they've valued one company. They say, this is much too difficult to do. I'm going to trust the market. But among the ones who picked, 7 to 2, valuation beats pricing. I haven't done a follow-up survey five years later. But if I track these people down five years later, whatever job they're at, bankers, CFOs, I'll wager that the numbers get switched. In other words, when five years later, if I ask these same people what they use to put a number on an asset, seven to two, they're probably picking pricing over valuation. So I started thinking about what it is about this process that drives so many people who are true believers in valuation into pricing. And I came up with three possible answers. One came to me while I was watching a Seinfeld episode. You've seen this, you've seen Seinfeld, right? Quintessential New York sitcom. And it's an episode where one of Jerry's girlfriends accuses him of being crazy. He says, Jerry, you're crazy. And, he's, and his response is, hey, if you think I'm crazy, you should see the guy who looks across the hall from me. You know who he's talking about, right? Who's, crazy, who's Seinfeld talking about when he talks about the guy across the hall? Anybody? Kramer. Kramer. And his point is, relative to Kramer, we're all same. And in a sense, pricing is very much the same way. Because in pricing, you're making a relative statement. I'll give you an example. You go into the doctor, the doctor says your cholesterol is 300. And then he says, that's not too bad. And you say, what do you mean that's not too bad? He says, relative to people who've died in the last week of heart attacks, you look pretty good. He's absolutely right. Technically you are, but because he picked the right group to compare yourself against, you could pretty much make the same judgment on pricing. You want to show me that something is cheap. All you need to do is compare it to something even more expensive. If you think so, if you want to show me something is expensive, all you need to do is compare it to something cheaper. We forget how much of valuation is, is selling. Selling to your colleagues, selling to your clients. It's far easier to sell a pricing than it is to sell a valuation. Here's the second reason why people like pricing. When you do your discounted cash flow evaluation, your insides are out there for everybody to pick apart, right? So the DCF you send me, I can tell you I don't like your growth rate, I don't like your margins, why is your cost of capital so high? And you have to defend all of those numbers. And that's a pain in the neck, right? Instead, if you told me I'm pricing my company at $60 because that's five times I've ever done, that's what other companies in the sector trade at. Think of how small the target is. I don't like five times ever done. Your response is take it up at the market. It's not my fault. I'm just the conveyor of news here. And finally, here's a part of pricing that leads you to essentially towards pricing as opposed to valuation. I think, and I'm a believer in value, that value valuations are more likely to be right than pricing. So let's make it 55-45 with valuation. And with pricing, it's 50-50. Even with valuation, you're never right 100% of the time. In fact, when you're wrong with valuation, you're far more likely to be wrong alone. With pricing, you're always going to have lots of company. In other words, you overpriced social media companies six months ago. Your defense is don't pick on me. I just did. Or airlines, right? Six months ago, you priced airlines and people come back and say, how come you priced it so high? Well, everybody else was doing it. When you're pricing, your defense is everybody else is doing it. With valuation, you're kind of stuck there alone. And you know what? Survival is going to lead you towards pricing. So the bottom line is no matter what you tell me you believe right now, the job you get will often require you to price things, which means we have to talk about doing pricing better. And the reason I bring this up
is often people say, well, if you're a believer in valuation, why do you bother pricing a company? Why do you use PE ratios? Hey, all, it's not an either or. Why can't I both value and price a company? So let's say I find Zoom to be undervalued. I'd like it to be underpriced as well. Why? Because then I have two things working in my favor. Ultimately, my test is do I make money? And it's easier to make money when it's both undervalued and underpriced. So I think pricing is still should be part of your arsenal because many of your jobs will require you to price things. And if you're a portfolio manager or an equity research analyst, your job description actually requires you to price things. So I think even if you're a true believer in valuation, you need to understand pricing. So what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about doing pricing better rather than talk you out of pricing. So let's start at the beginning. I said to price a company, you need to standardize the price. And you probably said, what are you talking about? A multiple is just a standardized price, and every multiple has a numerator and a denominator. So let's break down what the numerator can be, and then let's look at the alternatives that are available in the denominator. Whenever you look at a pricing multiple, the numerator always should be a market-based number. So let's look at the choices. You can look at the market value of equity. That's market cap. You can look at the market value of equity plus market value of debt, or people cheat and use book debt. Well, that's market value of the firm. Or you can take market value of equity plus market value of debt or cheat and use book value of debt minus cash. That's called enterprise value. All three are market judgments on what your company is worth. That's what goes into the numerator. In the denominator, here are your choices. You can divide by revenues. Why? Because desperation drives you up the income statement. Everything else is negative. What are you going to do? You're going to focus on revenues. If you don't have revenues, you might look at things that might give you revenues in the future. Number of customers, number of downloads, number of users. You can divide by earnings. Those earnings can either be to equity investors, net income, earnings per share, or it can be to the entire firm, operating income. You can divide by cash flow. That cash flow can be equi to equity investors with net income plus depreciation or free cash flow equity. Or it can be to the firm, where it can be operating income plus depreciation amortization, which is what EBITDA is, or free cash flow to the firm. It can be divided by book value. And there again, book value can be of equity, shareholders equity in the balance sheet, or book value of the firm, book value of equity plus debt. Or if you net out cash, you get invested capital. That same invested capital you use to come up with the return on invested capital. So in the numerator of market values and in the denominator of revenues or drivers of revenues, earnings, cash flow, or book value. So you can already see that for any company, you can compute dozens of multiples for the company. We'll talk about which one you want, might want to use, but at least let's start with, with some general principles. I'm going to give you a four-step process for analyzing multiples, where, which if you're consistent and you stick with these four, this four-step process, you're always going to be okay. So here's the first step in the process. I'm going to start by defining the multiple. Now, part of you is going to be insulted. You're going to say, I know what a PE ratio is. Do you? We're going to talk about it. Let's talk about differences in that definition. And I'm going to impose a couple of rules. One is what I call the consistency rule, and you're going to see it in a minute. And the other is, are those multiples being estimated the same way? Are they uniformly estimated for your companies? Define the multiple. Second step, I'm going to describe the multiple. What does that mean? I'm going to give you a histogram of what the number looks like. What's a high number? What's a low number? What's a typical number? Because how can you tell me something is high or low without getting a sense of the distribution? I'm going to do some basic statistics, or better still, play money ball so you can see what the numbers look like. Describe. Third step, I'm going to analyze the multiple. I'm going to break that multiple apart and look for the variables that drive that multiple. And it's not going to be rocket science. By the time I'm done, you're going to see the three or four variables that drive PE ratios. The, and the reason you care is these are the variables you need to control for when you use that multiple. Define, describe, analyze, and only then, and I'm going to apply the multiple. So you ready? Let's start with the definitional test. When I look at a multiple, no matter what that multiple is, there are two questions I ask. Is this multiple consistently defined? Let me explain. Let me go back a few pages. Remember that definition of a multiple? Numerator and denominator. Here's the rule. If your numerator is an equity value, your denominator needs to be an equity value too. If your numerator is a firm or an enterprise value, your denominator has to be a firm or an enterprise value as well. You think, what the hell are you talking about? Let me give you a very simple example. Okay? Let's take the most widely used multiple in the world, PE ratios. Let's break it apart. 
What's in the numerator? Equity value, firm value, enterprise value, when I do PE ratios. Anybody? What's in the numerator? Chen, go ahead. Uh, it's the equity. And it's price per share, equity value. All right. Let's go to the denominator, earnings per share, equity value, firm value, or enterprise value. Uh, equity value. Equity value, because it's net income divided by number of shares, earnings per share. PE ratio is consistent, thank God for small blessings. Most widely used multiple in the world is consistently defined. Let's take enterprise value to EBITDA. What's in the numerator? And what is enterprise value? It's market value of equity plus debt minus cash. It's the market value of the operating assets of the company, right? And EBITDA is a rough measure of operating cash flow to the company. It's earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, amortization. EV to EBITDA is consistent. What about price to EBITDA? I've seen this multiple computed. Bloomberg used to report this for companies until I drew their attention to it. What's, what's, uh, is price to EBITDA consistent? Price is an equity value, EBITDA is a firm value. The analysts who invented this multiple should be tarred, feathered and driven out of the fraternity, right? It's not consistent. Out of those 550 equity research reports I looked at 20 years ago, seven used price to EBITDA to pick companies. And one of them happened to be an old student of mine from 10 years prior. So I decided to give him a call. He said, who is this? I said, remember that valuation class you took 10 years ago? He said, vaguely. And I said, it shows. I said, what the hell are you doing? Dividing market value of equity by EBITDA, it's not consistent. He said, no, no, I'm being consistent. I said, what are you talking about? He said, I use price to EBITDA for all 15 companies in my sector. I said, that's a very weird definition of consistency. And I said, have you been noticing that companies with a lot of debt keep looking cheap to you? He said, yes, yes. And I said, have you ever thought about why that might be? Do you see why that might be? What's in your numerator? Market value of equity. If I go out and borrow 10 billion and buy back shares, my market value of equity is going to shrink. By my EBITDA is earnings before interest taxes, depreciation, amortization. It's unaffected by debt. The more I borrow, the cheaper I'm going to look on a price to EBITDA basis. Makes you feel superior, right? That dummy. But if you ever use price to sales, which a lot of people use, you're guilty of the same sin. The only reason you got away with it is the sectors you use price to sales in tend to be technology or companies with lots, very little debt. So you got away with it purely by luck. If you have revenues in the denominator, the right number to have in the numerator is always enterprise value. That's a consistency test. I'm going to give you, take you through a few more, but any questions about the consistency test? Yes. I have, a, I have a question. So, could you explain again why PS ratio, like we can get away with sales? The problem is not sales. It's with the market value of equity being used in the numerator. Sales belongs to everybody. Right? Equity is only the portion of the company that's equity invested. So, if you borrow a lot of money and you buy back shares, your equity will shrink in value, but your revenues are still going to be revenues. Highly levered firms will always look cheaper if you have a lot of debt. So it's a consistency issue. Caroline asks why you don't think in long term, long run terms. If you're, if you're investing, you are. But if you're in pricing, what are you doing? What, what's the word that I use when you play the pricing game? For the people who play the pricing game, what did I describe them as? Do you remember? Uh, I meant people who believe in price. Yeah, people who believe in price. Do you remember what I called them last, last session? Dave, do you remember? I call them traders. Now let me go back to Carolina. When you, when you, when you talk to traders, what's their time horizon? Short term. Very short term. So if you're a trader and you're doing pricing, you don't think in long, long run terms. You leave that to what you call the eggheads, the people who believe in valuation. So when you leave the valuation arena and you get into pricing, you have a very different perspective. It's all about making money and you don't care whether you make it in a day, two weeks, two months, because to you, it's all about buying at a low price and selling at a high price. 
Could you construct a multiple that's long term? Yes, you then have to use expected earnings over the next 10 years. But if you're going to do that, then might as well do valuation, right? Dave, you have a question? No, it's your just hand. hand is up. Okay, so that's the first question. Is it consistently defined? Remember that because about 20% of the multiples that I see reported by services don't pass the consistency test. Lots of equity research reports are built on a multiple that's not consistently defined. So I'll come back and give you a few more tests on the consistency. The second question though, is this multiple uniformly estimated? Do you see why that matters? Because if I'm going to compare this across 15 companies, PE ratios across 15 companies, I have to make sure PE ratio is estimated the same way for all 15. You know how difficult to test this, this is to me? Because first, you need the same accounting standards for all 15 companies, right? And second, you need the same degree of fidelity to those standards. Here's a general rule. Some companies are aggressive in how they measure earnings. They're not breaking any rules, but they're aggressive. Other companies are conservative. And if you don't bring that in, you're going to be buying aggressive companies because they'll always look cheaper to you because they report higher earnings. Consistently defined, uniformly estimated. So I'm going to put you through a series of tests. Let's start with P ratios. Here are TV shows matching to... Sorry, that's my Siri acting up. Okay. So let's talk about PE ratios. Okay. We know what the PE ratio is. The PE ratio is market price per share divided by earnings per share, right? Everybody knows what the PE ratio is. Even Anna Kornikova seemed to know what the PE ratio is, was. You remember Anna Kornikova? She masqueraded as a tennis player for a, for a while, won nothing, but it was in every commercial you could think of. No, I think of her as Maria Sharapova without the talent. Yeah. So this was about 20 years ago. Sh Charles Schwab had a commercial, and I'm a Schwab customer. I almost canceled my Schwab account right after this commercial came out, where Anna Kornikova was playing somebody. Must have been an actress because Anna was actually winning. And in tennis, you switch sides every two games to make sure you don't get the same the sun in your eye for the entire match. So they're switching sides in the middle of a tennis match. I don't know why this would come up. Anna turns to this actress she's playing and she says, price earnings ratio is price divided by earnings per share. And then she went on about talk about preferred dividends. But I turned off the TV and started thinking, does Anna Konakova really know what the PE ratio is? It's true, the numerator is the current price, unless you're one of those technical analysts gone crazy who likes using moving average prices for everything. But it's the denominator that you get the real differentiation, right? Because I can divide price per share by earnings per share in the most recent fiscal year, which for some companies is still 2018. I could divide price per share by earnings per share in the last four quarters, which is going to be through maybe December 31st of 2019. It could be price divided by expected earnings per share in the year 2020. You know how different that number is going to be with the crisis going on. Or I could divide price by earnings per share in the year 2025. You're saying, why would I do that? Desperation again. If every company in your data set is losing money, you know, the only way you can make the PE ratio look positive is by projecting out earnings five years from now and say, hey, my company looks cheap. It's trading at seven times 2025 earnings. I can divide by earnings per share, diluted earnings per share, primary earnings per share, partially diluted earnings per share. I can divide by earnings per share before extraordinary items, after extraordinary items. I once did this exercise, and you can try it for yourself. Pick a company like Cisco, widely tracked, widely followed. I computed 32 different PE ratios for Cisco at one point in time, ranging from 12 to 27. You see, how can the same company have PE ratios from 12 to 27, depending on how I defined earnings? You're saying, why does that matter? Remember we talked about bias? Let's say you are an equity research analyst and you really like a company and you want me to get to get, you want me to buy the company. So you come to me and say, and this company trades at a PE ratio. If, you're, if Cisco is your company, I told you the range is 12 to 27 and you're a bullish analyst. Which PE ratio are you going to latch on to, to, to talk about Cisco? The 12 or the 27? Anybody? If you're bullish on a stock, which one are you always going to use? You're going to use the 12 because you want to convince me it's cheap. So guess what? You always use forward earnings because it'll make your stock look cheap. In contrast, if you're a bearish analyst, you're going to latch onto the 27. Do you see where I'm going? Sometimes on CNBC, you'll see two 
experts on a company talk about the same company, widely held company, and they can't agree on a PE ratio. You say, how come? How can you not agree on what the what Apple's PE ratio is? Because each person is biased, and the PE ratio they latch on to will be different. In fact, if I'd been making that Schwab commercial with Anna Konnikova, I'd have made it differently. When Anna Konnikova turned to that actress and said, you know, P ratio is price divided by earnings per share, I'd have asked, I'd have got the actress to ask Anna, trailing earnings or forward earnings, Anna? Because then we would have found out whether Anna Konnikova really knows what the P E ratio is. Laura asked, why isn't there a standard way to define it? Because there is, I mean, we all have biases. Why should there be a standard way? Because all you need to do when, when you compare across companies is make sure you define it the same way for every company. There's no right PE ratio. There's a trading PE, there's a forward PE. Which one is better? Varies across sectors. So I wouldn't impose a standard, but I would. one of the things I, when I talk to people about PE ratios, and they say the PE ratio for the company is 15, I say, stop, stop. Tell me how you computed PE ratio. And they look at me like I have two heads and they say, you teach finance, you don't know what a PE ratio is? I said, Anna Konakova knows what the PE ratio is. I don't. Tell me how you computed the PE ratio because we can't even talk about whether 15 is high or low until I know this. So if nothing else, one of the things we need to be much more explicit about is how we compute multiples. So don't tell me the EV to EBITDA is six. Tell me how you computed EV. Tell me which EBITDA you're using because without it, we could be talking about apples and oranges. Okay. Any questions on P ratio? So let's stay on P ratios because um, you know we obviously have to compute P ratios. Let's say you're comparing P ratios across, across technology companies, many of which have options outstanding. You think, who cares? I have to compute P ratio for each company, right? And there are multiple ways I can compute P ratio. I can divide price by primary earnings per share. What is that? I just divide net income by the actual number of shares outstanding. I can divide price by fully diluted earnings per share, where I count all of the options as part of the share count. Fully diluted, I get lower earnings per share and therefore a higher P-E ratio. I can divide price by partially diluted earnings per share, maybe counting only those options that are in the money. So I'm going to get three different numbers, right? If you're comparing across technology companies and you don't want to end up with a biased comparison, you know what I mean by that? You're finding companies that are cheap simply because you're missing something. Which approach to computing P-E ratios is least likely to bias you? Should I use primary earnings, fully diluted, partially diluted, or should I be thinking about some other choice for computing P ratios? Anybody want to try? Enrique says fully diluted. Enrique, unmute yourself and tell me why you think fully diluted is better. Because I have some, you know, Emma, you want to try? Why is fully diluted? Better. Uh, yeah, sure. I think because most technology companies will be losing money um, at their, when they start. So no, no, but when they're losing money, you can't even use P-E ratios. They have to be making money for earnings per share to be even positive. Because earnings per share is negative, P-E ratio cannot be computed. So, yeah, it's, so these I are money-making companies. They, they're going to most likely do pick out options. Okay, so you want to count the options in because your point is it makes a big difference to me whether you have 100 million options outstanding or 10 million. Remember we talked about the option drag in DCI. That's, yeah, you're right. We should bring the options. The only problem with fully diluted is I'm counting all options equally, right? So an in the money option, an out of the money option, they all get counted in. And from an invest, as an equity investor, would you rather have your management options be in the money or out of the money? Let's say you own stock in the company and it has lots of options outstanding. Would you like those options to be you know, deep in the money or deep out of the money? Enrique says in the money. Do you want them to be in the money? Because if they're in the money, they're worth a lot, right? They make your equity worth less. You want them to be out of the money. So you want those options to be worthless because if they're worth a lot, they take value away from you as, you know, so essentially, you don't want these options. So you can already see that the problem with trying to adjust the share count is options don't fit neatly in there. So I'm going to tell you what should be done. Nobody does this. If you really want 
to be consistent, here's what you should do. In your numerator, you should have the total market cap. Don't do anything on a per share basis. Take the total market cap, that's the market value of all the outstanding shares, and then add the value of options outstanding. You know how we valued options when we did DCF? Value the options, add them to the numerator. And in the denominator, you use total net income. That is the most consistent way to compute PE ratio. So when you have lots of options, be very, very, very skeptical about per share numbers because those per share numbers can be all over the place. Let's talk about EV to EBITDA. EV to EBITDA, you know, I remember when I first started looking at equity research report in the mid 80s, you hardly ever saw an equity research report built around EV to EBITDA. Today, if you walk into almost every investment bank's equity research department, you look at their equity research reports, about a third to maybe 40% of all equity research is built around EV to EBITDA. And EV to EBITDA is very simple, market value of equity plus market value of debt minus cash. So as I said, many bankers cheat and use book value of debt, and I don't have an issue with that. I can see why they do it too messy to get market value divided by EBITDA. As I said, 40% of equity research reports now use EV to EBITDA. And we'll talk about why EV to EBITDA has caught on and become more popular, but once in a while I run into an equity research analyst who uses EV to EBITDA all the time, so I ask him a question. And I'll be quite honest, many of these equity research analysts don't seem to have the right answer to this question. I ask them why they net cash out of the numerator. Let me explain what I'm talking about. Look at the numerator and I ask them why they net cash out of the numerator. Okay. Do you see what I mean by net cash out of the numerator? Market value of equity plus debt minus cash. So I said, why do you net cash out of the numerator? Anybody want to give that a shot? Why do we use enterprise value where we net cash out of the numerator when we do EV to EBITDA? Chen, go ahead. Because um, I think cash is not a part of the company's operating asset, so they're not generating return on it. Okay, so should I be... So, you okay, finish the thought though. That's fine. So I'm netting cash out because it's not an operating asset. Why is it so critical that I net out assets that are not operating assets? Because of consistency? And you're, you're absolutely right. And the consistency comes apart from the fact that my denominator is EBITDA, and EBITDA measures only earnings from operating assets. And because it measures earnings from operating assets, I need to net cash out. But you see, you've opened a Pandora's box. What else should I be netting out of the numerator? What are the other non operating assets we worried about in DCF in addition to cash? Cash was easy. What is the more messy one? Remember cross holdings in other companies? Those cross holdings are non operating assets, right? The income from those cross holdings don't show up as part of EBITDA. So, in addition to netting cash out, I have to net out 10% of I might own of company A and 20% of company B. So, if I'm doing EV to EBITDA for SoftBank, I should be netting out the market value of Alibaba from my numerator. Otherwise, I'm going to get this horrendously crazy EV to EBITDA. So when you talk about consistency, it's easier said than done because people when they do pricing think that they've evaded this responsibility. But guess what? When you compute a multiple, you have to make sure it's consistent. If you have minority holdings, you need to be netting them up. And if you have a majority holding, you have a different problem. And here's what it is. Let's say you own 60% of a company. When you do market value of equity, the market's not stupid. It doesn't consolidate. It reflects only the 60% that you own of company B, right? But when you do debt, cash and EBITDA use consolidated financials, you've got a mess. So you know what analysts often do? They will add minority interest to the numerator. What does that do? It adds the 40% of that subsidiary that doesn't belong to you. Again, it's an, it's an attempt to be consistent. So there's cross holdings that gave you trouble with DCFs. They will give you trouble with pricing as well. So watch out for them if you're doing EV to EBITDA. Now, I know that's a lot I threw at you with the cross holding, so I'm going to pause and see if you have any questions on the cross holding. So you net cash out because it's clearly a non-operating asset. You net minority holdings out because clearly, again, they're not operating assets and your denominator is just the operating cash flow. And if you have a consolidated holding, you've got to bring in the portion of the company that doesn't belong to you because everything else in this equation is 100%. No questions? Think about it. I know it's a little confusing. Think about it. Work through the numbers. You know. Max, go ahead. Uh, 
Why? Because the income from minority holdings doesn't show up as part of operating income. And because it doesn't show up as part of operating income, it can't be part of EBITDA. It shows up below the operating income line, right? Okay, but if it's majority holding, wait. If it's majority, then you have a different problem. You counted 100% of the EBITDA of the subsidiary in the denominator, 100% of the debt and 100% of the cash, but in your market value of equity, you counted only 60%. Because the market knows you own only 60%. So if I own 60%, I add my the, holding it, and, I, and I can only have 60% of that company, what I own for that company? That's all is in the market value of equity. So you add the minority interest, which reflects the 40% that doesn't belong to you. Yeah, so rule out the 40% that, don't, that doesn't belong to me in the new return. Yeah, exactly. Okay, thanks. You're trying to be consistent. So, so basically, I'm just making sure that I either have 100% all the way through or nothing all the way through. Otherwise, I'll end up with this inconsistent multiple. Okay. Which brings me to a final pricing. And this is something unusual. Yeah? In real estate, often people wonder about bubbles in real estate. Real estate has been notorious for bubbles and bursts. And one of the ratios that people look at to see if real estate is overpriced is they compare housing price to annual rental income from a house. So I'll give you an example. The typical housing price in let's say, in a, in a part of the country is let's say a million dollars. And the typical rental income, if you rented out a house like that on an annual basis is 50,000. A million divided by 50,000 is 20. So basically your housing price is 20 times rental income. And they compare this number across time to see if that if that number gets really high, their judgment is housing prices have become too high. If the number becomes really low, housing prices have fallen too much. So it's a pretty sensible ratio. So I'm going to ask you a question. If I am trying to compare how housing is priced to how stocks are priced, and I'm using housing price to annual rental income to measure how housing is priced, what should I compare that to? for equity. Should I be comparing it to price earnings ratio, EV to sales, EV to EBITDA, or EV to EBIT for stocks? Enrique, you said PE. Let me, I know your mic is not working, but I'm going to zone in on PE and why it's not PE. PE, what do you have in the numerator? Just the equity value invested in companies, right? And in the denominator, you have earnings per share. Housing price is the actual total price of the house. It's not just the equity investment in the house. It's the total price of the house. So in the numerator, you have something like enterprise value. So it has to be enterprise value in the numerator. The question is, what's rental income closest to? Is it closest to revenue? Is it closest to EBIT or is it closest to EBIT? That's a tough one because it is like revenue, right? That's the total income you make. So you say it's more like revenue, but the expenses you have when you own a house is such a small percentage of that income that it's very close. So revenues and operating income, if you own a house, are very similar. So I think if I were comparing it, I would probably compare it to EV to sales, not to EV to EBIT or EV to EBIT or PE ratio, because the difference between between um, between income and operating income is so small. Carolina raises the EBITDA, but to make it EBITDA, I'd have to add back the depreciation of the house and I did not do that. So it's basically just the rental income. So I think it's got to be sales. And if you did EV to EBIT, I understand why you did that, but sales and EBIT are so close for a house, I would go with the EV to sales. So maybe you want to try that. Is housing overpriced? Maybe compare the EV to sales for equities to the housing price to rental income and see what you get. No, I don't know. Maybe that's a good way of seeing, good way of seeing whether equities are over or underpriced relative to housing. So consistency is critical and I think something to think about as you kind of look across stocks and look at different multiples. Any questions on the definitional test? Is it consistently defined? Is it uniformly estimated? That's the first stop. Max, you have another question? Is your mic open from before? Yeah, um, so for the EBITDA, so we rule out of 40% of the equity and debt that doesn't belong to us, do we also route 40% of the cash, you know? You can either take the 40% out from EBITDA, cash and debt, or you can add the 40% of the equity into the numerator. 
and make it all 100%. You can either make it all 60% or all 100%. So, so if I add 60% of the equity and debt, so I only add 60% of the cash? Exactly, and 60% of the EBITDA of the subsidiary. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Now let's talk about descriptive tests. One of my favorite movies of all time is Moneyball. Remember that movie? Uh, it's, uh, and it's one of my favorite books. If you've never read it, you should read it. It's a Michael Lewis book. And anybody remember the story of the book? What's, uh, you know, if you're a baseball fan, there's no way you cannot remember the story. What's the story of the book? Dave, go ahead. Let's not call them a bad team. They're a team that doesn't have a big budget. They're, they're a poor team because baseball is there as rich and poor teams. The Yankees are a rich team. The Oakland A's are a poor team. Keep going. And um, there's, I forgot the guy's name. Billy Bean. Bean. Billy Bean is his name. And Billy Bean comes in and he uses uh, statistical techniques to figure out the best hit rates. Okay. Um, and there's statistics in baseball to identify players to buy an adventure that leads them to the semifinals. As contrast to what, until Billy Bean came along, how, how was baseball run? How did they decide who to sign and who to, what, what was the pro? Basically, you had old scouts with storytelling, right? They said, oh, if his arm is bent, I saw something like this 27 years ago, and that guy turned out to be a really good pitcher, so sign him. And Billy Bean came in, and for the first couple of years, he listened to the scouts, and he realized they had no idea what they were talking about. So he said, you know what? I'm going to look at the data. Baseball is the most data rich of all sports. Right? Think about it. You know, every ball, every strike is recorded. So he went into the minor leagues and he, you know, for instance, one of the examples was he saw this guy called Kevin Euclid. He's a Boston Red. He used to play first base for the Boston Red Sox. Any of you have seen Kevin Euclid's hit? No, you may, some, most of you are too young, but you might have seen him when you were eight or nine if you're a Red Sox fan. Anybody see him? Uh, weird batting stance, right? Connor's exactly right. Your first reaction when you see Kevin Euclid is, is this guy is not a baseball player. He wasn't built like a baseball player. He didn't hit like a baseball player. But here's what Billy B noticed. In the minor leagues, Kevin Euclid was like the king of walks. He called him the Greek god of walks because he seemed to get on first base like 50% of the time. And you know what? In baseball, if you can get on first base, it doesn't matter whether you get there with a base hit or walk. He said, this guy... He gets on first base. That's all matters to us. He signed Kevin Euclid to a long-term contract. So basically, if you think about, and Euclid then got traded to the Red Sox for a much bigger price, but that's Moneyball. Basically, it's data-driven. You see why Moneyball is the perfect analogy in investing? Investing is full of rules of thumb, right? Like these old scouts. These old investors say, you know what, if you buy a stock for less than 10 times earnings, it's good. If you're trading less than book value, it's good. It's six times EBITDA, it's cheap. Who comes up with this crap? So the pushback is, why are we listening to these old scouts tell us things that really don't work? Why don't we just look at the data? So with multiples, there are all these rules of thumb, right? So rather than trust the rules of thumb, I'm going to look at the data. We can do that now. 50 years ago, we couldn't. And rather than you tell me that six times EBITDA is cheap, why don't you let the data tell me what's cheap, what's expensive? So here's what I'm going to do. With every multiple, I'm going to put up a histogram. I know that's a throwback to your statistics class, but remember what you do in a histogram? You count the number of companies with P ratio 0 to 4, 4 to 8, 8 to 12. You put them in a distribution. Rather than talk about it, let me show you what the histogram for the P-E ratios for U.S. stocks look like at the start of 2020. Okay? So look at the distribution. What's the first thing that jumps out at you when you look at this distribution? It's not symmetric, right? Already you can see that if you use anything that you learned on a normal distribution with multiples, you're going to get into serious trouble. In fact, the tail, the peak is to the left, the tail is to the right. And it will always be true when you look at a multiple that the distribution is going to look like this. And there's a simple reason why. What's the lowest value P-E ratio can take? Anybody? What's the, what's the lowest number a P-E ratio can be? Zero. Zero. You can't go lower than zero because if your earnings are negative, you have a not meaningful P-E ratio. So you have a zero P ratio. What's the highest value P ratio you can have? There's no upper limit. It's a right skewed distribution. 
You know what my professor in statistics told me when he had a distribution like this, we should do? He said, never trust the average. Why should you not trust the average when you have a right skewed distribution like this? What's going to happen? What's going to happen to the average? Be it will be higher. Why? Because all your outliers are huge positive numbers. There's no big negative number to offset. Your average is going to be high. You think, how big can it be? Well, let me show you what the numbers look like at the start of 2020. The average PE, if I look at trade, let's take current PE. Current PE is basically price per share on January 1st, 2020, divided by earnings per share in the most recent fiscal year, which for many of these companies was 2018. The average PE for U.S. stocks was 61. That's mind-bogglingly high, right? But before you freak out, look at the median PE. That's what my statistics professor said. He, did, don't, he said, don't trust the average, use the median. First rule in pricing, when you're comparing the PE ratio for your company to the PE ratio for 15 other companies, don't compare it to the average PE ratio, compare it to the median, because the outliers are going to create serious, serious skews in your average. Let me show you what the outliers look like. In, at the start of 2020, the highest PE ratio stock had a PE ratio of 9,181. In fact, the highest trading PE was 41,200. Why is it so high? The earnings per share dropped to a fraction of a cent. The PE ratio moves towards infinity. Your averages are always going to be skewed by this. That's why when you talk about pricing, it's always more sensible to talk about medians. In fact, I look at the 10th percentile, I look at the first quartile, I look at the distribution. Why just focus on the average? Because you have a skewed distribution. In fact, as I go from current P to trailing P to forward P, there's something else that happens that I'd like to ask you why it might be happening. First, if you look at current P, I had 7,082 companies in my sample, but only 2,948 had current PEs. What happened to the other 5,000 or 4,200? Chen? Um, because a lot of them are losing money. Exactly. And this was in 2019. Can you imagine what that's going to look like in 2020? 2020, I would be surprised if the 20, 2948 became a thousand, that most companies lose money in 2020. You think, so what? I still have 2948 companies. It's a big sample. But do I have a biased sample, you think, when I... When I threw those companies out that were losing money, they were not random companies, right? They tend to be smaller companies, riskier companies, higher growth companies. I'm in a sense skewing my results because I'm throwing away companies. We introduce bias in the most subtle ways when we pick a multiple. With current P, I'm throwing out all small money losing companies. As I go from current to trailing to forward P, if I look at forward P, especially as I go from current to trading to forward, I lose another 500 to 600 companies. Okay. What happens when I do forward P that leads me to lose another 500 or 600? What do I need to do forward P? I need to divide price today by expected earnings in the next four quarters, right? To get those expected earnings, I need somebody forecasting those earnings. You know what I lose? I lose any company that's not tracked by an analyst. I lose when I go to forward PE. Again, I'm losing really small companies that are not tracked by analysts. My point is we introduce bias when we do pricing all the time and we don't even think about it. So think through that process because there is bias and there is this asymmetry in the distribution that if you're not careful can lead you to the wrong conclusions about what's cheap and what's expensive. Any questions on the statistical part? Now, at least until 2004 or five, I used to do this only for US companies. Do what that distribution you saw, I did it only for US companies because I didn't have access to raw data outside the US. So I'd go to Mumbai or I'd go to Sao Paulo and I'd put this graph up and some old analysts probably in his 50s or 60s, to put up his hand and say, that might be what it looks like in the US, but it looks not, nothing like that in India or in Brazil. And he said, how do you know? You know? They said, well, it's gut feeling. And then after about the fifth or the sixth time I heard gut feeling, I said, you know what, I don't trust your gut. 
So I started getting access to raw data around the world. And now, as you, you know, if you go to my website, you will actually see this distribution computed for every company in the world. So at the end of every, uh, when I do this, I, I create these histograms, basically not just of US companies, but of, by region of the world. So take a look across the regions of the world, because in this one picture, I'm trying to capture what's high, what's low, what's typical in different parts of the world. So let's focus on the median first. I said medians are the most meaningful number. If I look at the medians, what's the cheapest market in the world? Where are the cheapest stocks? Eastern Europe and Russia, right? You're saying, this is good. Let me sell all my U.S. stocks and buy Eastern Europe. Not so fast, right? Because often when you see things are cheap, there's a good reason why they're cheap. India was actually, had, I was surprised, had the second lowest, well, because India usually ranks in the higher numbers. Then you had Japan and then you went across. You have much wider dispersion in some markets than others. But what I've tried to capture in this one graph is a picture of the world. And the reason this is useful is when somebody comes to me and says, I have a stock that trades at 12 times earnings. Is it cheap or expensive? What's the first question I need to ask them? Where's the stock listed, right? Because if it's listed in Russia, I might say 12 times earnings might look cheap to you, but it's not cheap in that part of the world. Second, I've also listed out the percentage of companies I'm losing because they're money losing companies. So if you look at that last column, the median PE ratio for Indian stocks might be 13, but 32% of Indian companies are money losing companies. They don't have a PE ratio. So what I've tried to capture here is how similar markets are. They all have that left peak and right tail, but also the differences across markets in the same graph. It, it's a very useful table to kind of use to kind of get a sense of what's cheap, what's expensive. To me, the first quartile is my measure of cheap. For a global stock, at the start of 2020, if you traded at less than 9.89 times earnings, you were cheap stock. For a Japanese stock, you know, 10.36 times earnings is a cheap stock. But for an Eastern European stock, six times earnings. So you can already see that I, if I have the rules of thumb, they're based on the data, not based on some 75-year-old analyst saying, trust me, I know what's cheap. Any questions on this distribution? Ian asked, 80% of companies in Canada are losing money. Yeah, there are a lot of natural resource companies in Canada and Australia, and it was a bad year for natural resource companies. No, cannabis stocks don't explain it, Adrian. That's a good try, though. It's natural resource companies, because uh, it's been a bad few years for natural resource companies, mining and oil companies in particular. In Canada, there's an awful lot of them. And it'll be even worse this year. 2020 is going to look horrendous for natural resource companies. Sometimes the differences are revealing though, because in January 2013, because I've been doing this every year now for a long time, I look across differences and you can see Japan stuck out like a sore thumb. The median price to book ratio for a Japanese stock was 0.67 trading. Now, now that doesn't necessarily mean Japanese stocks are cheap because remember book value is an accounting construct and Japanese accounting actually pumps up book values for companies. But even if you adjust for it, it looked like Japanese stocks were cheap. And you know what the best performing market was in 2013? Japan. Sometimes the table can be a useful way of thinking about where should I be putting my money. Now, you, you asked a good question about um, cyclical industries. Does it take into account them? It does, this doesn't because I used the trailing 12 months. And the reason that matters is if you have a cyclical company in a recession, the trailing 12 months are going to look awful. There's a version of PE you can compute where you normalize earnings. You look at earnings over five or 10 years, and that's perfectly okay. It's a different way of scaling companies. So you have cyclical or commodity companies, you can try that normalized earnings. Maybe that's a more reasonable way to look at Canadian and Australian companies than the trailing 12 months. And finally, as I said, one thing that drives me crazy are these rules of thumb. Six times EBITDA. I don't even know who invented this multiple, but I've never understood it. Where does it come from? Because I remember a guy coming in a private equity, lead head honcho, private equity guy. You know, I met him at a conference and he said, oh, this valuation is a waste of time. We know what's cheap. It's always six times EBITDA. So I went back to my, 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 my office and I sent him this graph and I said, really, six times EBITDA is cheap? Because in January 2010, half of all U.S. companies traded at less than six times EBITDA. 
That's a very weird definition of cheap when half your company is traded less than that number. So I don't care who the person is. When somebody says 10 times earnings is cheap, one time, trading at less than book value is cheap, just go to the data and check for yourself because that's the only way to make sure that they're not making up stuff. And guess what? Most of the time, they're just making up stuff. Any questions before we move on from the descriptive section? Go ahead, Laura. Laura, your mic is open so you can ask a question if you want. I can't hear you though. Okay, if you, if you can figure out your mic, well, you can come back on and ask me the question, but no. And as I said, six times EBITDA might be cheap in 2020 because multiples are much higher, it might not be in 20, by the end of 2020. So it's a, what I'm arguing for is if you have the data, why are we making up these fixed absolute numbers as cheap? Let's let the data tell us what the, what the first quarter, maybe we should say the first quartile is cheap and compute that whenever you look at a multiple. We have the data now, we should be able to do it. And you have access to S&P Capital like you. You can do exactly what I've done here. For yourself if you don't believe my numbers so define describe if there are no questions Laura have you figured out your mic or are you still unable no okay let's talk about analyze right? when we analyze a multiple there are two questions we're trying to answer first is what are the fundamentals that drive this multiple in a few minutes I'm going to show you that when I look at a PE ratio there are three variables that I need to control for payout ratio growth and cost of equity. So how do you come up with those? That's one of the tricks I'm going to teach you is when, uh, when you have a multiple, how to figure out what the variables are that drive that multiple. And second, I'm going to, you're also going to need to answer the question, how as that variable, how, as those variables change, will the multiple change? Let me explain. One of the variables that drive P, drives PE ratio is growth rate. And the direction of the relationship is pretty straightforward. Higher growth companies tend to have higher PE ratios. That's the answer to the first question. But then if I asked you, how much higher will my P-E ratio be if I double my growth rate? That's the second question. You're saying, will the P-E ratio be twice? Maybe not. That's what the second question tries to answer is, how is those variables change? Will my multiple change? So what are the variables that drive my multiple? And how has those, uh, do, as those variables change, will my multiple change? So yeah, go ahead, Laura. Okay, good. Yeah. So mute yourself when you get a chance. Yeah. So let me give you the device that will allow you to answer that question. It's simple algebra. Let's say I want to explain an equity multiple, P ratio, price to book, whatever the multiple is. The easiest way to see what drives that multiple is to start with the simplest version of a discounted cash flow model you can to come up with equity value. So simplest version I can think of is a stable growth dividend discount model, right? The stable growth dividend discount model, I take the expected dividends next year, which is as earnings per share times the payout, divided by cost of equity minus the growth rate, I get the value per share. You see? But we're doing pricing. Why are you going back to DCF value? Let's say I divide both sides of this equation by earnings per share. I'm allowed to do that, right, in algebra? If I divide price by earnings per share, I'll end up with P ratio. If I divide the right side by the earnings per share, the earnings per share will cancel out. Or if I want price to book, I divide both sides by book value of equity. I get price to book on the left hand side. Earnings per share divided by book value of equity gives me return equity. The variables that drive price to book are return equity, payout ratio, cost of equity and growth rate. Just by using a dividend discount model, I can come up with the variables that drive price earnings, price to book, whatever equity multiple. If I have an enterprise value multiple, then I'm going to go back to the simplest enterprise value mo model that I can think of, which is a stable growth free cash flow of the firm model. Where in the numerator, you have after tax operating income times one minus the reinvestment rate. What is that? That's my free cash flow of the firm. Divide by cost of capital minus the growth rate. If I divide both sides of this, this, this equation by sales, I get EV to sales on the left hand side. On my right hand side, I get the variables that drive EV to sales. Margins, reinvestment rate, cost of capital and growth rate. So what I'm doing is I'm starting with a discounted cash flow model and with a little algebra converting it into a model for a multiple. It's not because I want to use this equation to come up with the multiple. It's because I want to see the variables I need to be thinking about whenever I use the multiple. So when I use price to book, 
and I'm comparing price to book across companies, I need to control for differences in return equity, difference in payout, difference in cost of equity, difference in growth rate. When I compare EV to sales across companies, I need to control for differences in margin, difference in reinvestment rate, difference in cost of capital, difference in growth rate. It gives me a way of deciding what I need to control for when I compare across 15 or 20 companies. Okay. I'll use lots of examples to illustrate the process, but kind of think about this trick because it's a very neat trick. So let's say I want to find out the variables that drive the PE ratio. Equity multiple, right? So I go back to a stable growth dividend discount model. Expected dividend next year divided by cost of equity minus the growth rate. I divide both sides by the earnings per share. I end up with dividends per share divided by earnings per share's payout ratio. I need it for next year, so there's a 1 plus G divided by R minus U. The variables that drive P ratios are payout ratio, cost of equity, and growth rate. I am trusting the company to pay out what it can afford to in dividends. You're saying, what if I don't have that trust? Replace dividends with free cash flows to equity. The P ratio for a mature company is its potential payout ratio, defined as free cash flow to equity as a percent of earnings, growth rate, and cost of equity. It's a very neat trick because it allows you to control for differences across companies. Now, can I use this same process to estimate the period? Because when I use that stable growth model, it's for a mature company. So what if I have a high growth company? What if this is Zoom? Can I compute what the PE ratio should be for Zoom? Yeah, if you're willing to build on your discounted cash flow model. You can't use a stable growth model anymore. Here, I have a two-stage dividend discount model. It looks, you know, this equation, I'm sure you've never seen this equation before because usually we do it in an Excel spreadsheet. You know what this equation is? The first term in the equation is the present value of the dividends during the high growth phase. That's the present value of growing annuity. So that's what that second part of the equation is. So if I have expected dividends during my growth phase, that's what the first term in the equation captures. You know what the second term is? At the end of 10 years in a dividend discount model, what do I do? I compute a terminal value. The second term is, the, is that terminal value discounted back to today. So present value of dividends during my high growth phase plus present value of terminal value. This is just an equation capturing what we normally do in an Excel spreadsheet. Now let's say I took this equation and divided both sides by earnings per share. Again, I'm allowed to do that. If I divide both sides by earnings per share, here's what I end up with. I end up with the PE ratio for a high growth firm. And guess what the PE ratio for a high growth firm is dri driven by? Payout ratio, cost of equity, and growth rate. Exactly the same three variables I had with, this, with the mature company, but I just have to estimate them twice. So the neat thing here is even for a high growth company, you can find out what the variables are that you need to control for by going back to a stable growth equation, which is a much simpler equation. Because expanding the equation just means you compute the same variables multiple times. You don't add more variables to the equation. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take this equation and I'm going to create, a, let's make up a company. Let's make it a very simple high growth company. Here's what this high growth company looks like. It's going to grow 25% a year for the next five years and pay out only 20% of its earnings. Why is the payout ratio so low? Because I want to grow fast. My beta is one. At the end of five years, they become a stable growth company. Different time and age, don't even look at that growth rate. But at that time, 8% was a growth rate you could use forever. 50% payout ratio, because my growth goes down, I should be able to pay out more. Beta stays at one. So high growth, stable growth, low payout ratio, high payout ratio, same risk. Let's say my cost of equity was 11.5%. And you come to me with a question, I said, Tell me on an intrinsic basis what the PE ratio should be. You say, what the heck do you mean, intrinsic basis? If I did an intrinsic valuation of this company, what would the PE ratio be? That's easy to do, right? Because of the equation from the previous page. I take the 20% payout ratio, that's the first term, 25% growth rate, 11.5% cost of equity. So that's the present value of dividends during the high growth phase. At the end of the, ten, of the five years, my payout ratio jumps to 50%, my growth rate drops to 8%, my cost of equity stays at 11.5%. I plug the numbers in and I come up with a PE ratio of 28.75. You see, what does that tell me? If this company is priced the way it should be, given its fundamentals, it should be trading at 28.75 times earnings. That's an intrinsic PE. It's basically a discounted cash flow valuation of your company converted into a PE. You're saying, why are we going back to DCF? I'm going to do some what-if analyses here because I'm interested in a couple of questions. One is, 
Remember, I'm pay, why am I paying such a high P-E ratio for the company? Because I expect it to have high growth in the future, right? So here's my first question. What would happen if my expected growth rate surprises me? In what way? I can get much higher growth than 25% or much lower growth. If I get a growth surprise and the growth turns out to be higher than 25%, guess what? My P-E ratio is going to be much higher. And if the growth is much lower than expected, my P-E ratio is going to be much lower. You say, I knew that already. So why are you showing me this? And why are there five different columns? I'm sorry, four different columns. Basically, I looked at the P-E ratio under four interest rate scenarios. A T-bond rate of 4%, a low risk-free rate. The green at the other end is a high interest rate scenario. So let me ask you a question. P-E ratios rise with growth rates in every interest rate scenario, but they seem to rise more when interest rates are low than when interest rates are high. So I have an intuitive question. Why is the P-E ratio for a stock much more sensitive to growth surprises when you have low interest rates than when you have high interest rates? Why do interest rates even enter into the equation? Anybody want to give that a shot? Chen, go ahead. Exactly, right? So when you have a high risk-free rate, you have a high discount rate. The value of growth is all in the future. Let's make this an extreme risk-free rate. Let's say you're in Venezuela. You know what the risk-free rate is in Venezuela? Let's say it's 50,000%. You know what the value of growth is when the risk-free rate is 50,000%? It's zero. High growth, low growth, it doesn't matter. The value of growth is a percentage of value becomes much higher when risk-free rates are low, which means that when you get a surprise to your growth rate, it's going to have a much bigger impact when risk-free rates are low. Let's make this real. Are we in a low risk-free rate world or a high risk-free rate world right now in much of the world? Low. Yeah. And what does this graph tell you? When you have, are we going to get an earnings surprise this year? Absolutely. We're going to get the mother of all earnings surprises, right? And when risk-free rates are low and you get an earnings surprise, guess what the effect is? It's much, much bigger than it would have been if interest rates had been 5 or 6 or 7%. Think of this as the dark side of low risk free rates. Small earnings surprises will cause big changes in stock prices. It's not a, that markets are irrational or crazy. One of the reasons we're seeing the volatility we're seeing in markets is because risk free rates have become so low. So that's something to think about when you think about low risk free rates. This is a side effect of low risk free rates is prices will become more volatile. Any questions? Tim? Yes, another question. What about the negative uh, risk free rates and prices? Well, think of that as a continuum. To me, negative risk free rates, just the same graph keeps going. It makes it even more difficult to not react to growth because when you have negative risk free rates, you're really paying a huge premium for growth because your cost of capital has become so low. Okay? So when you have negative risk free rates and high growth companies, they're going to be incredibly sensitive to earning surprises. So second what if question I asked was, remember in my base case, I used to beta one. I said, what would happen to the PE ratio if the beta increased? No surprises here. If I keep growth constant and I raise my beta, my PE ratio decreases. Why? Because riskier growth is worth less than safer growth. So, but let's play a little game. Let's assume you're a company with high growth. Let's give you 20% growth rate and a beta of two. So you're a high risk, high growth company. So right now you're trading at this really low PE ratio. And you're the CEO of this company. Let, no, I'll play the role of CEO. You can help me out here. So I come to you and say, look, I want to increase my PE ratio. What are the two things I can do to increase PE ratio? I can go for more growth, right? And if I go for more growth, leaving my beta at two, I'm moving in up and down in this section. What's the other thing I can do instead of going for more growth? I can try to make my company less risky. Where do you think the payoff is greater for me as a risky high growth company to go for even more growth or try to make my company less risky. If I go for more growth, I'm kind of stuck right here. If I go for less risk, I move across the graph. Much bigger payoff, right? I think going for less risk gives you a much bigger payoff. 
But you know what? When you're in a growth company, you get so focused on growth, sometimes you forget about risk. If I were advising Zoom, you know, I'd say, look, you're going to have a lot of growth potential, but I think you need to start thinking about bringing down risk because the penalty you will pay for being a risky company is going to overwhelm your growth benefit. So sometimes for growth companies, it makes sense to bring risk down, especially in environments like this one where people are worried about whether you'll make it. So it requires a change in focus that many CEOs of growth companies are unable to make. It's what Jeff Bezos did really well in 2001. When the dot-com bust happened at Amazon, he changed the focus of the company to survive and reduce growth, reduce risk because he said, I need to reduce risk now because people are punishing risky companies. You ask the question, if you change risk, couldn't it potentially change the business model? You're right. You don't want to go overboard and make yourself into a mature company. But you do want to create less risky business models. So if you're a software company living on upgrades, try to go to a subscriber-based model. So that's what I mean about changing risk. It's not fundamentally going into a safer business, but changing the way you do business so your revenues get a little more predictable. So if you Zoom, I would try to sign up a lot more subscription-based models which are long-term. Give people a discount. Right now, they love Zoom. Give them a five-year subscription model. You're going to give up some growth as a consequence. But guess what? You're going to reduce your risk if you do that. And that's a good thing in this market. So I'm going to use this at least to get started in a series of examples. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to play the role of a really dumb analyst. And I'm going to put out these recommendations that are patently stupid. And I want you to shoot me down. You ready? It's March of 2014. Russia has just invaded. It just, it's just before the Ukraine in, incursion that Russia had made. I come to you and say, look, I've looked across P-E ratios and Russian stocks look really cheap. They traded four times. Only. This is an actual graph. Russia looks really cheap. So that's my recommendation. Take all your money by Russian stocks. What should your pushback be? Think about the drivers of P ratio. What are they? Risk through the cost of equity, growth and return, and basically payout ratio, return equity. Think about what the problem is with Russian companies. Why, why might that four times earnings not be cheap? What, what's your, what should your pushback be? What do Russian stocks have that should, should explain at least a portion of why their P E ratios are so low? Go ahead, Chen. Um, might it be that E is inflated and the is by E to Well, I think one of it market could be D that the accounting might. So one thing you worry about when you see a really low P ratio is the accountants really screwing with me. And with Russian stocks, there's an accounting issue. So that's part of it. I agree. So that's the first thing. That's good. Let's start with that. Make sure the accounting. Let's say the earnings are not inflated. What's the next stop? What do we say high-risk high stock should have in terms of P-E ratios? Holding all else constant, what should happen to P-E as risk goes up? It should decrease. Are Russian stocks riskier than stocks in much of the rest of the world? I think so, because you have corporate governance issues. There have been cases entire companies have been you know, taken away from their owners. So Russia is a much riskier market. I'm not trying to talk you out of buying Russian stocks. I'm trying to add cautionary notes. If you tried this today and you looked at markets, you see Venezuelan stocks traded less than one-time earnings. And you say, that looks cheap. Let me put all my money in Venezuelan stocks. You'd be crazy. So when you look at difference in P-E ratios, always stop and ask the question. Is it a cheap stock or is it just really risky or is it a really low growth? Is the accountants lying to me? You've got to be skeptical. And that's what I want you to do as we go through these examples. I want you to play the role of a skeptic where you say, hey, the P-E ratio looks cheap, but... Okay. So next session when we start, here's what we're going to start with. We're going to start with a bunch of emerging markets. And I'm going to give you, uh, because you're saying how cheap is cheap, we're going to give you, I'm going to give you a way in which you can control for differences in risk and growth across emerging markets. And I'm going to use statistics to control for those differences. So we'll start with the spades next session when we, when we begin. So you now, are there any final questions before I close for today? No questions? Austin asked a question about netting out minority and majority interest again. Let me go back to the EV tab because I know that sounded, you know, I think that's what you talk about, right? What, what? So it goes back to the definition of EV. I'm sorry, I'm going the wrong way. 
Let me go back to the EB debit dot definition so you can see what he's talking about. So basically, here's what I uh, was talking about. I said it's consistency, that what you have in the numerator should reflect what you have in the denominator. EBITDA reflects only the, the what you have in operating assets. So in the numerator, you cannot have any non-operating assets. That's why we take cash out. And that's why if you have minority holdings of other companies, you have to take them out because they're not treated as operating assets. The income from those assets shows up below the operating income line. So since they're not part of EBITDA, I need to take them out of the numerator. That's with minority holdings. Okay? Any, are you clear about the, so why we why we take out minority holdings? Austin, does it make sense? Okay, so let's talk about majority holdings. When you own 60% of a company, what are you required to do? You're required to consolidate, right? What does consolidation mean? When I look up the EBITDA, the debt and the cash for the company, I'm getting a consolidated debt, which means I'm acting like I own 100% of the subsidiary. But when I look at market value of equity, the market value of equity reflects only the 60% of the subsidiary that I own. So I have one, num one item that doesn't sync with my other three. It's not consistent. So you know what I have to do? I have to add the 40% of the subsidiary that doesn't belong to me. And one simplistic way of doing that is to add the minority interest to the numerator. So minority holdings I subtract out of the numerator, minority interest I add back to the numerator. In both cases, I'm trying to be internally consistent. Rodrigo has a question about office hours. Yes, I will have office hours. Every Thursday, in fact, we'll have office hours. So you know, think about it. As I said, we've gone through a lot on pricing today. You know, try to compute some multiples for your stock because that's the best way to see how they work. But on Thursday, we will have office hours. And actually, if you want to do the pricing of your company quickly, it's, a, it's much quicker than doing your DCF. You can get the project pretty much done this week if you want on the pricing front. Yeah. Any last questions before we end? Okay, I'm going to end the session since there seem to be no other questions and I will see you on Wednesday. Take care.